Hi everyone, um, my name is Roxy Robles. I'm so excited to be here um, with Adventure Cycling and uh, excited to share time and knowledge with all of you. I use she, her pronouns and um, I'm gonna be taking us through an introductory uh, yeah, presentation on bike touring. Next slide. Okay. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I live on the unceded ancestral lands of the Duwamish people, uh, a people who are still here continuing to honor and bring light to their ancient heritage. Uh, if you want to know whose land you're on, you can check out native-land.ca. They have a great map. Uh, before we really get started, I understand it's difficult to uh, reference a video presentation, so I wanted to let you all know that I have a self-published book about bike touring, and it's available on my website, feelsonwheels.net. I have paperback copies on pre-order right now. This is like the first copy ever printed. Um, and there are also ebook options in English and Spanish, so go ahead and get your copy. So the course is going to cover a number of topics and we only have an hour. So I'm not gonna be able to go into deep detail on any one thing. However, there are a lot of resources on my website, including the books uh, that can help you continue to learn and develop the skills you need to have fun and be safe while touring. Um, again, my name is Roxy and I currently work as an urban planner in the Seattle region. I've been lucky to have been a cyclist for most of my life. I've been bike touring for about uh, four years and have been organizing and mentoring other cyclists throughout that time. I got tired of reading uh, blogs uh, written by dudes with a patriarchal and macho tone, so I decided to start making my own resources. Um, <clears throat> you can writing and resources on my blog and also follow me on Instagram to stay in touch. All right, so what is bike touring? Some of you may be familiar with the concept. Some of you may be coming to this just out of pure curiosity and you're starting from square one. Um, so bike touring or uh, bike camping, bike travel, bike packing, um, you may have heard people throw around these terms. Uh, there's a lot of different terms for camping and survival gear on a bike. I use many of these terms interchangeably. I think uh, the only term that I would draw out quickly is bike packing. I think when people refer to bike packing, they usually mean a backcountry or off-road overnight uh, trip on a bike. Otherwise, use whatever feels right. Oh. What? Oh, sorry. Is that good? This is good? Yeah, <laughs> yeah this okay. is good. Thank you. So I just, I, I wanted to um, address some of the frequently asked questions that I just get every time I do this presentation. Um, uh, at the top and get them out of the way. So number one thing people are worried about, what if I get a flat tire? Um, being able to patch or replace a tube is one of the most priceless skills you can gain as a cyclist. 99% of the time, this is, gonna what's, this is going to be what keeps you from going. Um, it takes some practice, but when you get it down, it can be like a five to 10 minute procedure. So practice, save yourself money from going to bike shops, still support your local bike shop, but um, you can definitely master this. It's not as hard as you think. Uh, people also ask where to get water. This is going to depend on when and where you are going. Most campsites have water sources, but, and I'm, and I'm going to guess that at least to start, many of you will be traveling along roads that have gas stations, grocery stores and the like to access potable water. So that won't be too much of an issue but make sure to just do some reconnaissance ahead of time, make sure you have water along the way. Uh, please also note that, um, you know, water sources can sometimes be seasonal. So uh, if you are doing a backcountry route or a route where you are going to have to rely on natural water sources, make sure to um, check out whether or not those are going to be running before you, you know, go out into the, into the wilds. Um, I usually bring a water filter just in case. Um, you can be in whatever shape you are, because even if you drive nine miles towards a campsite and bike the last mile with your 
uh, camping stuff, I think that counts as bike touring. Uh, I wouldn't worry about being in a specific type of shape or having a specific uh, ability. I think people of all abilities uh, can start bike touring where they are. Uh, do I have to spend a lot of money? Uh, I have to recognize that anything bike related is not usually cheap, but there are ways you can rent almost anything nowadays. And um, if there are cycling or touring focused clubs or social media groups uh, near you, you can always ask folks to borrow stuff until you know how you want to invest. Uh, thrift, buy used or scour Craigslist or eBay until you get what you need. Oh, and lastly, uh, I get asked, is it safe? Uh, safety means something different to every person. So it's hard to answer this, you know, uh, without knowing specifically what someone is uh, worried about. But um, make sure to let reliable people know where you're going, uh, when you plan to be back and um, do this even if you are going in a group. Um, <clears throat> when possible, choose roads and trails designated for cycling. Um, Always wear a helmet and always wear things that help you be visible, such as reflectors and, uh, and lights. And then uh, travel with basic repair and first aid. And if you don't feel safe at a campsite, just trust your gut and uh, relocate if you can. All right, and then if you have any other, if you have questions, make sure to drop them in the chat box and our wonderful moderator, Carmen, is going to be um, throwing out uh, at, the end, at the end of each section. Do we have any questions so far? Oh. Um, Elisa, I'm not getting that much. Um, I don't know. Okay. Beth, like I'm but I'm not sure if anyone else is, if you want to let us know, but I'm, I'm getting okay over here. We will also have a transcript available. Um, so if you sign up for the recording, it'll be on the link. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, uh, moving on. I want to talk about touring bikes and other bikes you might use for touring uh, because I learned a lot about bikes when I needed my commuter bike to perform at a higher level for touring. So, um, if you know a little bit more about bikes and bike types, just be patient. We'll get to more touring specific stuff in a minute. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, there are, um, you know, bike frames and bikes that are made specifically for touring. That doesn't mean you can't, you know, use them for commuting or, or gravel riding or anything like that, but, um, some characteristics of these types of bikes, they usually have a longer wheelbase, which is the space from um, the front hub to the back hub uh, that makes it more comfortable over uh, longer distances. Uh, it has a little bit more upright position as compared to maybe like a road bike. Um, it's got eyelets for racks usually. Um, and then uh, the fork and frame are, some, are built for wider wheels than you know, your typical road bike. Another bike type that is great for touring is a hybrid bike. This is kind of your typical commuter bike that you might uh, find at REI or, um, you know, there's a ton of these types of bikes on Craigslist and stuff like that. Uh, these usually have a more upright position and because they're made uh, for racks and um, can usually handle, you know, being loaded. Uh, gravel bikes are also a great option. Uh, they have a higher ground clearance, keep you away from the muck. Uh, they have a shorter wheelbase than a uh, typical touring bike uh, because you know they need to handle a little bit uh, more ability. Uh, but uh, gravel bikes that might work for touring is that they can accommodate wider tires. Uh, bigger tires mean um, you know a cushier ride because there's more air being in the pavement. These also often have eyelets where you can mount the types of bags and luggage. And then we have bikes. Um, these bikes are usually have an aggressive stance. Uh, they're usually made out of aluminum or carbon and um, they're not usually built to hold, uh, you know, be loaded with everything you would need for a bike trip. So I, I'm not saying you can't use your road bike for um, 
overnight touring, but depending on what the frame is made out of, you might want to check the manufacturer's uh, predictions as to what the weight capacity is. So uh, bike fit for any kind of cycling is important, but when you're being loaded and for long periods, bike fit can make a big difference and proper fit will prevent injuries. If it's affordable to you, I highly recommend a professional bike fit. A good bike fitter shouldn't be selling you a bunch of expensive components and they should work with the bike and the budget that you have. So um, a, a good bike fit, your elbows are relaxed. Uh, when they're on the handlebars, your hips have a little bit more than a 90 degree bend, but not much more. You shouldn't be, you know, like bent in half. Um, and then what's really important is having a 30 degree bend in your knee and your when your foot is at the bottom of the pedal stroke and then having your knees kind of directly over the pedal. This is going to prevent knee injury and um, yeah, keep you happy and riding for a long time. So um, most bikes are sized by the length of the seat tube, which is shown there on the left side of the screen, but sizing is not by any means standard. Uh, bike size, uh, you know, it varies from brand to brand and even within brands and depending on the model. Um, oh, yeah. Um, so uh, you can look at the C2 blank that will give you a good idea of the size and there are lots of uh, bike sizing charts out on the internet you can use. If you are finding, a, finding it hard to get a good fit, you might also want to look at the specifications of the bike or the frame. Um, they'll usually have the stack and the reach uh, listed. The uh, stack is distance from the bottom bracket to the top of the seat tube and it roughly cor cor correlates to your inseam. And then uh, reaches a distance from the bottom bracket to the steerer tube, and it will roughly correlate to your arm length. So nobody has a standard body, so sometimes it's helpful to look at these to get a better fit. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about components. Uh, components are everything besides the frame. When you are buying a bike um, or frustrated with the bike that you have, you can always change out the components for better performance or a better fit. Uh, we'll be talking about saddles, the drivetrain, tires, uh, pedal, uh, handlebars, and a quick note on fenders. So saddles, uh, this is if you're going to invest in anything as an upgrade, I would recommend it be a comfortable saddle. Um, it may seem counterintuitive, but a firmer saddle is better in general, but especially for touring. Um, a firmer saddle will reduce friction, which irritates skin, which causes saddle sores. And saddle sores, I got them for the first time last summer. They are a beast. They're no fun at all. So do what you can to uh, reduce your risk of getting saddle sores. So um, if you consider that your butt is wiggly and then if you have a wiggly gel saddle over a full day of riding, that ton of friction uh, on your skin and it's just a recipe for disaster. So the, the firmest saddle that you can deal with or afford, go for it. Um, there are a ton of options when it comes to saddles. So um, don't get overwhelmed, just test ride them if you can. Some bike shops keep saddle libraries for this purpose. And then um, I've gotten most of my saddles secondhand because people will buy saddles, try them out, not like them, and then resell them. So I've gotten all my uh, like fancy saddles on uh, eBay for like half the price. All right, so a little note about your drivetrain. Uh, your drivetrain is the engine of your bike and it has several different components. Um, keeping the drivetrain well-maintained with regular cleaning and lubrication is going to prolong the life of all these metal components and make riding a lot smoother. Um, I just wanna say that uh, because touring involves um, riding with a loaded bike, sometimes it's um, to your advantage to upgrade parts of your drivetrain. So on the right, you'll see chain ring. That's like the front part of your drivetrain. It's connected to your bottom bracket and the pedals. And um, this, the chain rings are better. Bigger chain rings are great for speed. And then the rear part of your drivetrain, that's called the cassette. Um, a bigger range there is better for climbing. So depending on the type of riding that you're trying to do, you 
you know, if it's, if it's affordable to you or if it's possible with the bike and the derailleur that you have, um, if you're looking into touring, especially in hilly terrain, uh, think about upgrading your cassette. Um, you by no means have to, but um, it's just something that I ended up doing on several of my bikes and um, it's made a big difference. Uh, tires are the outer layer of your wheel and they provide puncture protection and grip for different types of surfaces. So the width and knobbiness of a tire should be proportional to the roughness of the terrain. So um, that's why mountain bike tires are so wide and so knobby. So even if you're only riding on paved roads, there's usually a potential for riding on like a gravel shoulder or encountering gravel and grit on the road. Excuse me, so wider tires um, are a nice thing to have for touring. Again, you don't have to do any of this. These are suggestions. Uh, but wider tires also provide more shock absorption and are more comfortable over long distances. The width of the tire that you're able to put on your bike is gonna be on the width of your fork and the width of your uh, seat stay. So um, take it to a bike shop, talk to them about getting wider tires because not, uh, not everyone can fit, you know, super wide stuff on their bike frame. Um, so tubes go inside the wheel or go inside the tire and they're filled with air to create a fluffy surface that's easy to ride on. So tubes come in a variety of sizes and need to be sized to the wheels and cycling goals. Uh, that's like a, con that's conventional. People usually have tubes inside of their tires. Uh, tubeless tires have become more popular in the last two decades. They have been most popular among mountain bikers, but have become more popular in other disciplines. Uh, their popularity comes from the diminished likelihood of flats on rough terrain, but you know, it's not foolproof. Um, tubeless systems require special tires, rims, valves, and sealant to properly seal out air. Um, if a flat occurs in a tubeless system, repairs can be more difficult because of the precision needed to create the proper seal. So a conventional tube and tire setup called a clincher, that's the one on the left, uh, can still be used on a tubeless compatible rim uh, and you can convert to tubeless down the line. So um, you by no means have to have a tubeless uh, setup to bike tour, but uh, I think some people hear tubeless and they're not really sure what the heck that means or like what it looks like or how you, they would do it on their bike. But um, I made this diagram to kind of help show the, the difference between the two. So obviously in the tubeless, there's no tube and um, the sealant and the uh, seal between the wheel and the tire are what keep everything uh, inflated. Do we have some questions? No, just reminding people, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat. Okay. Maybe we'll go to the next slide and uh, the people with questions can type their stuff in and we'll get back to it. And then just a quick note on fenders. Fenders are pretty great. They uh, protect you, your gear, and your friends from mud and water flying around. So. Um, I live in the Pacific Northwest and they're almost a non-negotiable. Uh, and if you consider that you're riding with a group in a potentially wet conditions, um, people might hate you if you keep splashing muddy water all over them. So uh, consider fenders if you're gonna be on a muddy ride. So we do have a question. Did you wanna? All right. Okay. Um, it looks like it's a question about uh, bigger cassettes. Um, okay. Um, so it uh, looks like Andy's question is, uh, now that there are 11 by 36 cassettes or larger, um, are triple front chain rings still useful or are two by chain rings? And uh, I don't know. So this is an intro thing. I'm not sure, Roxy, if you want to sort of talk about I, the, that. Yeah, I can talk through the difference. So what they're talking about is, um, you know, when we go, when we think about um, how the drivetrain is set up, um, there are sometimes there's, you can have a different number of chain rings on the front of your drivetrain or, uh, sprockets within your cassette in the rear of your drivetrain. So what they're asking about is, is there 
is there a functionality in having three chain rings versus having two or or fewer chain rings since a lot of people have found it you know um easier to maintain yeah there we go so in this image there's um looks like two chain rings um up there um but two by and one by um setups meaning two chain rings or one chain ring have become more popular um I think you need to just work with what uh, you have or what's available to you. I have uh, three chain rings on my uh, touring bike and I like having those options. So, um, and it depends on the terrain that you're going on. If you uh, want three chain rings, go for it. If you want to go for it. I don't think there's any, uh, I don't think you need to debate this a whole ton. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? Yeah. All right. Well, we'll we'll keep going, and uh, I will. I'm going to agree, Roxy, to your okay. point. All chain rings, good chain rings. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's talk about gear. Um, I think this is probably one of the more overwhelming parts of uh, bike touring. Well, besides packing, and that's a whole other thing we're going to talk about. But um, I think gear meaning you know the luggage that you use to carry all your survival stuff um can be kind of overwhelming for novice uh bike campers and um i just want to let you know that it's okay your uh gear can change over time you can borrow gear you can just strap random bags to your uh bike i've seen that happen um just be safe you don't want anything like falling off your bike and getting caught in your wheel and then uh disaster happening. So um, yeah, let's talk about some different types of bags. So um, for first time or novice bike campers, I recommend a setup like this. Um, this is my bike before my first bike tour in 2017. Um, I just, I recommend a rear rack and panniers. Um, Panniers where get really easy to just stuff a bunch of stuff in there and go, and then you can strap whatever you need to the rack. Um, I brought these front panniers uh, with me on this tour, but I really didn't end up needing them. I bought really big rear panniers, and so um, they really held a lot of my stuff. Uh, baskets and uh, basket type bags. I know a handful of people that love basket touring. You can just slap a backpack or a duffel bag in there and strap it down with, um, you know, one of these nets or a um, bungee cord and all your stuff is on your bike. Uh, randonneur bags or rando bags are pretty handy. They mount to these little racks called decalers and they can fit a surprising amount of stuff and then um, I've had these, they're really nice for city riding too. Um, Cause you can just, if you're commuting you just put your lunch and like a jacket in there. Uh, fork bags or cages mount or strap to your fork as the name would suggest. Um, they can hold water bottles, canisters um, and dry bags. So pretty handy little things. They're mostly used by bike packers, but, um, and you know, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> Uh, frame bags are great. They come in a variety of sizes, as you can see, you know, full frame or like partial frame. Uh, they're a great place to snack, stash snacks or a water bladder. Um, that's how I roll. I put uh, the water bladder in the frame bag and then have the little tube come up. So then I can always grab a quick drink while I'm riding. Little Top tube bags are great. Um, you can just put things that are that need to be easily accessed, like snacks or um, you know flat repair stuff. Um, keep it all handy. And then uh, handlebar bags. They also come in a variety of sizes and types, um, from basically like duffel bags with straps to uh, in the center there is like a cradle that holds a dry bag. And then um, these are awesome. I I got two of these um, this year and I use them all the time. They're like little snack pouches that just kind of mount to the inside of your handlebars. Um, 
yeah, water bottles, energy gels, whatever. Um, you can just stuff those things. It's amazing how much they can hold. Um, and then saddlebags. Um, these are these can hold a bunch of stuff. Um, usually they strap to the the saddle stays and um, or ha they have special hardware that helps it mount. But these are pretty popular as well. Okay. Right, so, we had a couple questions. Can I? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, one, I think we'll probably be getting to Elisa. Um, I see your question. I hope you pronounced that right. But two questions that are related are um, questions about the advantage to carrying weight in the front instead of the rear. Um, or, and the other question is if you only have a rear rack, do you really need a front rack? So maybe you could talk about like where stuff should go on the back. Do you really need a front rack? Um, I think I've traveled both ways and I think it depends on, um, a, what you can afford and what's accessible to you. I think that, uh, rear racks are really easy to get and pretty cheap. So if a rear rack is accessible to you, then there's no harm in that. It also depends on your preference. Um, some people really like being front loaded and some people prefer being rear loaded. Um, I... I will tell you that I do not like riding front loaded. So I, I only use a rear rack. To David, can, that is that is my preference. Can you elaborate on uh, why you don't like yeah i have tried it both ways um my rear rack was one where the panniers were neck on the wheelbase so next to the wheel um and i just i prefer the way that my body is shaped which is short and squat having not like having the ability to move my handlebars a little bit more freely i don't like being feeling like i'm being pulled when i'm going down a hill um although it is nice to push your gear up a hill instead of pull it but yeah, that's just my preference. So I, I really do think it's a preference thing. Yeah. Yeah, it is a preference. Although actually one thing I will say, I rode, um, I did like a week long tour last year, uh, rear loaded and my rear tire got completely destroyed because with all my gear and my butt kind of on the rear, like all that weight on the rear tire, the rear tire wore out like super fast. It was like crazy, excuse me. The front tire was like fine and then the rear tire was completely bald by the end of the trip. Um, so there is an advantage if you're worried about your, um, maybe your tire health over time to distributing the weight a little bit more, but honestly, it's just gonna be preference. I'm not gonna say this whole, <laughs> my thesis about bike touring <laughs> is do what you want, like do what feels good. I'm not, there's no way for me to say that there is like one way to tour one way to ride one way to set up your drivetrain or whatever because it's going to depend on what's accessible to you and if i were to say you need to ride this way you need to pack this way then yeah then that's like cutting out a whole variety of ways of being and and options and like maybe you can't afford having a whole new bike you know, rack gear set up so you can travel front loaded. Like who cares? It's just it's about having fun. It's about being out on your bike. So um, try it out, borrow bags. If you don't um, want to ride front loaded, you don't have to. If you don't want to ride rear loaded, you don't have to. Um, just make sure that you're prioritizing fun and safety and um, using what's accessible to you. Awesome. Well, um, Elisa, I think we'll get to your question pretty soon. So we're going to keep going. Okay. Yeah, so let's talk about what to pack. Um, so I think packing is one of the most nerve wracking things for most new and novice bike campers. And I just wanna let you know um, that if you start with short trips to places that aren't too far flung, you are gonna be fine. Uh, it's perfectly normal to need to pick up food or gear along the way. I've gone, um, you know, I've gone into the woods and thought that I would be fine with just a hammock. But of course, I live in the Northwest and then it started raining. So I had to like bike into town, pick up a tarp and then like rig a shelter over my hammock. Otherwise, I would have been completely soaked. You know, stuff happens. Um, so 
when you're thinking about packing or like making yourself a packing list, um, I suggest breaking it down into categories that make sense to you. I've broken it down into the ride, sleepy time, hygiene, camp kitchen, playtime, fashion, and food. Um, those are the categories that make sense for me, but you know, mix and match uh, as to what makes sense for you. So the ride, you need to think about what you're going to need to make it through the day uh, comfortably and safely. So you know, all your bike, your bike bags, uh, bike lights, uh, helmet, navigation to get you where you're trying to go. And then, you know, basic repair stuff for your bike, you know, a little bit of chain lube, multi-tool, zip ties and bungee cords do not leave the house without them or, or uh, also wall straps are also priceless. Um, I can't tell you how many times a zip tie or a bungee cord has saved the day. <laughs> um, uh, make sure you have a patch kit and or extra tubes, tire irons, you know, everything to change a tire. Oh, and of course your water bottle or a water bladder. And then um, sleepy time, your, your sleep setup, you know, could look a, a lot of different ways, um, but make sure to have it all with you. And then hygiene could also look different depending on what you need. Um, I like to have a little bit of chamois butter with me just in case. Um, yeah, some, some people like it, some people don't, but um, it's always nice to have a little extra in case somebody needs it and, um, you know, keeps them from getting a saddle sore. And if you don't know what chamois butter is, it's like a lotion that has antiseptic and uh, anti-friction qualities. And then you kind of smear it on wherever you're getting friction. So usually around your butt and your crotch, and uh, it keeps you from getting a saddle sore. And then camp kitchen, you want to think about what you're going to need to cook. Uh, it is perfectly okay to get takeout. It's perfectly okay to just bring like those backpacker meals that just need, you know, some hot water. It's okay to not cook and just bring a bunch of like cheese and crackers. Um, do whatever you feel comfortable doing. You don't have to bring a fancy camp kitchen if you don't need one. Um, and also consider how you will spend time at the campsite, unless you just want to stare into space the whole time, but sometimes having like a frisbee or tarot cards or um, you know a sketchbook can be really nice to pass the time. Um, I get a lot of questions about what the heck do I wear. Um, uh, these are two outfits that would be you know pretty easy to put together for you know riding during the day. Um, on the left, it's like kind of a Merino jersey, uh, you know, something breathable, something you can zip down if you need to, a down vest, so like a lighter warm layer you can take off when it gets warmer in the afternoon, and then bike shorts um, because you hopefully will be biking. Um, and then on the right is an outfit that you could probably put together out of stuff that you like already have, like it's not very fancy at all, you know, cotton tank top, a flannel that you can take off when it gets warmer later and then just some like yoga pants or hiking pants. Um, and that should be fine. You don't need to buy special jerseys or um, special bike shorts. You can just, you can tour with athletic clothes that you already have. Um, so yeah, we talked about the ride. Um, another thing I will add to um, ride fashion is, um, having some kind of eye protection because when you're riding for long distances, the wind and like grit from the road or bugs or whatever um, can be really annoying. So um, have sunglasses or if it's not sunny enough to have sunglasses, sometimes I'll just wear those like safety glasses from a hardware store. They're clear and then they just offer some protection for your face um, without, you know, having the uh, sun shading. Um, other helpful layers to have at camp are a puffy jacket, you know, rain jacket and pants if you think it's going to rain at all, uh, wool base layers for sleeping or if it's really cold in the morning, um, you know, some kind of head cover and um, flannel, extra, extra layers for camp, depending on the weather. Um, and then of course, your necessities, you want your undies and some wool socks. All right, so Food, I think also stresses people out. Again, get takeout or order a pizza to your campsite. Um, there's no rules. Um, 
but you're going to be, depending on how far you're going, I mean, you can burn a ton of calories biking with a loaded bike. So keep eating throughout the day, make sure to keep yourself nourished, make sure to stay hydrated. Um, this is a basic guideline for um, how to think about your food sources so you don't get bored, especially if you're going on, you know, multi-day trips. Um, rough guideline, you know, bring stuff that you like to eat. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, these are some suggestions for things to pack. This is not uh, prescriptive by any means, but uh, my usual breakfast is like, yeah, some kind of instant coffee, or if you want to bring your AeroPress or your pour over or bring a battery powered espresso machine, I don't know, have your coffee or your tea or whatever. Um, I will usually do like quick oats with um, like powdered peanut butter or protein powder in it and some chia seeds. And that is that kind of like, I don't know, that sticks to my stomach and that keeps me going until, I don't know, snack time at like 1030 or whatever. Uh, lunch, you'll usually be, I would, I would assume that's what I do, but you know, it depends on your route. Um, you, you will probably be eating it on the road. So it'd probably be like quick stuff that you can like slap together without, um, a stove or whatever, or it can be takeout again, no rules. Um, so tuna packets, tortillas, salami, uh, cheese sticks, uh, nuts, trail mix, stuff like that. Um, I like to, if you're assigning like meal categories, I like assigning someone to happy hour or, you know, just thinking about happy hour as its own meal, because sometimes you'll like get to camp and be starving and need to unwind. And it's really nice to have a glass of like bagged wine with a, you know, square of chocolate before you set up camp. Um, and then dinner, think about, um, yeah, this is usually stuff that you could cook with your camp kitchen, you know, stove, um, or, you know, slap together, you know, there are going to be some, if you're going on like a multi-day trip, trip, especially, there are going to be some nights where you're going to be tired and you don't want to pull out the camp kitchen and you just want to eat like, I don't know, a can of beans with some spinach. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So I don't know, Roxy, if you want to address this while you're going, but we had had a question earlier when we were talking about gear from someone about, um, like ultra light gear and like how to carry things just because like, do you pare down how, like, um, I guess it's that, do you use ultra light backpacking gear? I can't imagine fitting all my camping gear on my bike. So um, I don't know if this will inform this as well, but maybe you can talk about that. Sure. That is, um, yeah, that's a good distinction to make. Um, so yeah, your usual car camping gear will probably I mean, I'm not saying that you can't bike with it. It's all about your tolerance um, and the weight capacity of your bike, but you will probably want to be looking for backpacking type gear. So like a backpacking stove, backpacking tent, because these things are, um, you know, they're lighter, they're less bulky, they're made for fitting in like a small piece of luggage. So um, yeah, when you're looking for camping gear, you're going to want to be looking for stuff like that. And then I'll have a resource on the next slide or two um, for cheap ultralight gear. Um, are there any other questions around gear or food? Um, there's, a, there's a question about uh, keeping food away from animals, but I believe that you talk about that soon. Is that correct? Did I make that up? Um, I can't remember, but I can talk about it now. Um, right. yeah, yeah, know where you are going and what kind of animals you have to look out for. Bears are a whole another animal wink. Um, yeah. So if you're going to a place with bears, you definitely still need to bring a bear canister and you need to be conscientious of where you're cooking and, um, cleaning and leaving food scents. And you need to make sure that you are sleeping far away from that stuff. Um, so do your research if you're going to be in bear country. Um, I mean, chipmunks and uh, squirrels and stuff can still really mess up your gear. They can chew through tents, they can chew through bags. So um, make sure that everything is just like sealed up. And um, I mean, chipmunks and stuff can still climb things. Just don't put, just don't keep your food in your tent. That's like the number, number one thing. Do not keep food or anything smelly like toothpaste, deodorant, uh, chapstick, don't keep it in your tent. Um, I'm not gonna go over 
like a ton of the principles around camping uh, since we are talking about bike touring and there's a whole, you know, bike touring is its own kind of discipline and that's what we need to be focusing on tonight. But um, yeah, <laughs> I could probably do another presentation about how to get camping too. Um, any other questions in that realm? I'm also dropping a link that Adventure Cycling just published about being bear aware. Um, and so it's in the chat. You can take a look at that. Um, it has some great tips. So yeah, we can keep, let's keep going. Sorry. Okay, so um, the 10 essentials for camping and outdoor survival, um, you can find on REI's website or a lot of places on the internet. Um, yeah, think about navigation, have a headlamp, have sun protection, first aid, knife, uh, a way to make fire, um, have your shelter, and then you know, plan for extra, food, extra water and clothes. Um, and this link below, makein.meet slash shoestring, is a regularly updated link that has um, a list of ultra light, ultra cheap gear. Uh, I think it's like I think it was on Reddit, and then it became so popular they just made it their own, its own uh, website. But it is it's really cool. Um, some of the stuff looks like I would probably beat it up, <laughs> but um, if you're if you're nice to your gear, uh, that's probably a great resource. And then um, leave no trace principles are also worth mentioning. Even though many of our um, pub, uh, national parks and uh, public lands have been taken by force from indigenous peoples, uh, it's still important to protect them as a public resource. Um, so leave no trace, you know, plan ahead and prepare so you're not uh, burdening rural communities with your needs, you know, to the extent possible. Um, travel and camp on durable surfaces, you know, don't go off trail, uh, don't cut things down in the, in the name of exploring. Um, those of waste properly, and sometimes that mean, might mean taking stuff with you. Um, leave what you find. Uh, you don't need to take every rock and every plant with you. Uh, minimize campfire impacts, and if you are traveling in the West, maybe don't set a campfire at all. Um, life and then just be considerate of your uh, other fellow recreators. Okay, we're going to talk about safety and hygiene on the road. So, um, main thing I'm going to say for cyclic space, especially if there isn't a shoulder present. So, um, you know, on the left, you know, if there is a shoulder or a bike lane, I recommend people ride, you know, kind of to the inside of the shoulder or the bike lane, you know, kind of like I ride like on the line um, because that means that the motorist will see you. If you're like off hidden on the side of the shoulder, you could be in shade of trees, you know, people might just not notice you. The further you, the closer you are to the drive lane and the closer you are to the cars, the more likely they are to see you. And then, um, if there is no shoulder present, just like you should be either like in the driveway, drive lane or just like as close as you as you can be comfortably. Um, you just you want to be visible. And then also keep in mind that um, several states have regulations around uh, how much birth a driver is supposed to give you. So I know in Washington state, cyclists are allowed to be two astride and uh, drivers have to give us four feet of passing distance. Um, just uh, be aware of your, your rights um, as a cyclist. And then other ways to be visible, always have lights and reflectors. Um, even though it's kind of dorky, reflective vests come in really handy, especially if you're riding at night. And then um, apparently this is a very popular adventure cyclist uh, tool, the pool noodle. Uh, for people riding like Trans Am, I guess it keeps uh, big trucks from uh, getting too close. Uh, hygiene. So, excuse me, before riding, if you remove body hair, um, avoid removing uh, leg and crotch hair, you know, three or four days before, excuse me, before you go on a big ride. Um, hair growth can just create more irritation and friction and um, that's a recipe for ingrown hairs or saddle sores, and nobody wants those. And then um, during the ride, 
use chamois butter um, and any, any skin treatments that you need to uh, keep your skin healthy and wear breathable fabrics um, just so that I, I know usually when people are riding, they're wearing kind of like tight stuff, but wear breathable stuff to the extent that you can, just so you're not trapping a bunch of sweat and bacteria by your skin. Uh, once you're at camp, take all your sweaty stuff off, wash it or dry it out or whatever you are able to do. Um, wipe yourself down with like some baby wipes or take a shower or jump in a lake or something. And then, um, yeah, keep yourself limber, stretch, hydrate, and keep eating. Okay. I need a little sip of water. Do we have any questions on hygiene or uh, being visible on the road? No? Anybody? Good? Okay, we're gonna keep going. But remember, <laughs> any questions you got, drop them in there. Okay. So, uh, uh, next slide. Um, think about where you want to go, uh, what natural wonder might near be, be nearby, where you always wanted to go. Um, also consider where there may be uh, already be established bike trails or bike ways and um, use those to kind of guide your planning. Um, this can take, it can take some experience to understand how long it's going to take you to get from A to B and like what your riding pace is and what your riding pace is loaded, especially. So this takes some experience. Um, Google Maps can give a good estimate of ride time, but um, getting a sense for how fast you ride over different types of terrain can be tracked by apps like Strava. You can just kind of like track yourself and see what your estimate was versus what how long it actually took you. Um, I, for myself, I estimate about 10 miles an hour and uh, you know, when I'm thinking about a longer ride and uh, that, but that might be too fast or too slow for you. So you just have to figure out what works for you. Um, when you're out riding, also try to keep in mind that how far you're really going and what elevation you're covering can affect that. Um, find a pace that's comfortable for you and um, factor in snack stops and rest stops. You don't wanna burn yourself out before you, uh, you know, make it halfway through your ride or whatever. Um, all right, let's talk about elevation. This is a very important part of route planning. Um, both these routes, I found them on Ride with GPS. Um, I need to mention that Ride with GPS is a great resource for finding and planning routes. Um, so these are two routes. Um, one, the top route is 32.8 miles, has um, like, let's say 2,200 feet of elevation gain. The bottom route is 53 miles, has about 2,600 feet of elevation gain. So around the same amount of elevation gain, um, the top route is much shorter. However, if you look at the elevation profile of the top route, this is going to be much more strenuous, even though the highest elevation is like 400 feet above sea level, a little less, look at how it goes up and down like constantly. Like if you were riding this route, you would need to think about how you were going to be just like basically constantly climbing uphill. Um, this route is called the Chili Hilly. It's like a, it's a ride that a bike club around Seattle puts on every year. And um, yeah, this is a difficult route even for an experienced cyclist. Um, <clears throat> the route on the bottom, it's significantly longer, but you can see that there's more gradual climbs and even though the top elevation here is a little under 1500 feet above sea level, um, the, the climbs are much more gradual and then it kind of just coasts downhill towards the end. So I've ridden both of these and I can tell you that even though it's 50 miles, the route on the bottom is far less strenuous because elevation um, isn't as intense. Okay, uh, also consider daylight and climate when you're planning a ride. Um, think about, you know, sunrise and sunset. How much daylight are you going to have um, when, you know, to get to your campsite? And are you okay riding in the dark? Um, these are things to consider when you're putting a route together. Um, think about where to stay. You know, campsites in uh, on public lands are a good option, but... Um, you could also try out things like HipCamp. Uh, it's kind of like a, an online app-based 
rental rental for um, campsites. And I think they have like yurts and cabins too. Um, Warm Showers is a touring specific resource uh, where other cyclists host cyclists, traveling cyclists in their homes. Um, you're also allowed to stay at a hotel. There's like no, um, no rules. Again, if you wanna stay at a hotel, you're completely allowed. Um, some contingencies to consider when you're planning a route, think about where, um, especially when you're maybe a, a new or a novice uh, bike tourist, um, think about where your turnaround point might be, you know, like if you're not feeling good by the time you get to this town or this park or this ferry, you know, like maybe this is where you turn around because, you know, you might lose cell service or it might be like a big hill or whatever. So just think about where your turnaround point might be with the turnaround point for like how your body is feeling as well. Um, think about meetup points if you're uh, rolling with a group. Uh, meetup points can be a little bit more organic, but it doesn't hurt to talk about them if you're riding in a group. Usually people spread out over the ride because of, you know, different abilities or maybe people feel different minute to minute. Um, so just pause and let everyone regroup uh, occasionally if you need to. Um, if you are writing a group as well, or even, I guess, by yourself, just be flexible and open to alternatives. Um, it's, it's okay if stuff doesn't go according to plan is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, and then, you know, in within being flexible, just have a good attitude and respect your group's uh, physical and emotional needs and check in on one another. Um, this picture is uh, a great example of how being flexible and having a good attitude can get you through a lot. Um, this photo is from a ride through the Willamette Valley where there was some miscommunication and I didn't really realize that the first day was going to be 90 miles. I was told it was going to be 70 and uh, the weather was in the 90s. It was awful. Um, I was so exhausted at this point and everyone in the group, there were like 15 of us, everyone had different ways of coping because everyone is very different. Um, so, I mean, I think this ride tested a lot of people's patience, but um, I think about, <laughs> I think about this ride and I think about how I was able to kind of like stay positive and stay patient. Um, and then it ended up being a really good time despite the miscommunications and the, the really tough weather. Um, have fun. I really hope that um, I've imparted to you that touring should be about, you know, being outdoors, having fun with your friends, and it should, there's no real rules when it comes to a lot of this. So plan fun stuff and like, be open to little adventures uh, when you're touring. Um, wine tasting, going to a donkey farm, um, having a big burger, um, that center photo with all the kombucha. Some friends and I were riding outside Wenatchee and um, tried some kombucha in this like quick mart. And then we like found where they made it because we thought maybe they would, I don't know, let us taste some. And then we ran into one of the employees and they just gave us a case of the kombucha and they were just so sweet and showed us around. So um, anything can happen if you're, you know, just flexible and uh, have a good attitude. Um, so if you liked uh, any of the information in this webinar and want to go deeper, I have a lot more information in my book. The paperback is on pre-order right now. If you order by September 17th, you will get the first, uh, you'll be on the first, I uh, guess, batch of orders. Um, so I really hope that you uh, order the book and uh, stay engaged with me through my website. Awesome, Roxy, thank you so much. Um, we do have time uh, for some questions. Uh, we have some props though. Great presentation intro. Thanks. Um, we will be sending out the recording. I will be putting a link to it. Um, if you signed up, we will send you a link to it. Um, it will be on our Facebook groups and our YouTube channel. Um, and we will have a transcript as well. Um, yeah. Oh, wow. We have some, some really great feedback here. I'm glad. Um, and just, uh, yeah, to the point of like the gear um, that someone had asked earlier, I do 
you know, it is possible to carry heavy gear. You just might not want to go for that many days, you know, like having, using your camping gear for an overnight is, is totally cool. You just might not want to like haul it around for ever. Um, but I think it's trial and error and yeah. Oh, everyone's really excited. That's great. Um, I know there's been a question about e-bike. Oh, oh, here we go. Okay. So how often are cars involved in your trips? Um, like driving to somewhere and then biking somewhere. Um, I do that quite often, actually. Um, I think because uh, even though I live in Seattle, which has wonderful access to public lands and natural resources, um, sometimes you want to get away from the spots that are like accessible right out of town. So um, I've driven to Oregon quite a few times for tours and, um, you know, sometimes to get over the mountains. Again, no rules. Um, if you want to drive, uh, you know, half a mile from the campsite and bike the rest, that's completely allowed. Yeah, there's no, there's no such thing as cheating. Um, mm -hmm. And then, yes, this is the question. Uh, what do you think of e-bikes for touring? Uh, if you have an e-bike and you want to take it touring, I think you should do that. <laughs> yeah, I think I would. I think about that a lot. The second I can get, especially like some friends, pedal assists, then I'm like, all right, we're made. We can do this. I'm excited. So yeah, I think it would be tough if you're in a group who where not everyone else has e-bikes, you know, you'd be out ahead of everyone. But otherwise, I think I don't see any reason why you shouldn't use your e-bike for touring. Yeah. Um, Roxy is wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, if you would like, definitely please pre-order her book. And what else? You will be featured in a presentation in about a month from now. So yep. come back. She's great. Oh, where can you get the book? I'm going to put a link in the chat right now. <laughs> Fieldsonwheels.net. Yeah, fieldsonwheels.net. Um, there you go. Oh, wait, no, that's not right. Sorry about that. Everyone. Um, yeah, uh, Roxy will be joining us in another presentation later on, right before Bike Your Park Day. 